Zonta International once again presents the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories webinar series. And I welcome you to my conversation with Ambassador Milan Vivier. I'm Lynn Foley and I'm truly privileged to speak with the remarkable women who are so generous with their stories and their time. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and also pay that respect to any First Nations people present. Zondra International is a leading organisation globally working together to build a better world for women and girls. Milan, I warmly welcome you to our conversation today. Thank you so much, Lynn. It's an absolute pleasure. And as we begin, I'll give our audience just a short introduction to you. But of course, um, your achievements and um, thoughts on the world today will be revealed as we have our conversation. So Ambassador Vivia is the Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. She previously served as the first US Ambassador for Global Women's Issues, a position, a position sorry, to which she was nominated by President Obama in 2009. She coordinated foreign policy and activities relating to the political, economic and social advancement of women, traveling to nearly 60 countries. Prior to that, um, Ambassador Vivier has had many experiences working um, in and around government, particularly um, with First Lady, uh, Mrs. Clinton, and has authored books and has and is now, of course, working still on empowering and working with women. Uh, and I know, Ambassador, your um, mission, I guess, in life seems to have a huge amount of synergy with the Zonta International Mission. So let's get going with our conversation today. As far as I'm concerned, your life achievements to date are singularly impressive. There's so many opportunities to make a difference on the global stage. I'm keen to hear, though, where your story began and how your upbringing influenced your interest in politics and global issues from that very early age. Well, I'm happy to begin, Lynn, but I think what you said about uh, symmetry between Santa International and your extraordinary members who are committed to creating a difference around the world uh, really resonates strongly with me. So I'm really pleased to have this opportunity. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I think the great inspiration in my family came from my father. He was both a small businessman, but he was also uh, the postmaster of um, our small town. And he was extremely civic minded, uh, constantly explaining what he was doing and why he was doing it. It was a place that endured economic strains. And so he was so active in trying to bring small industry into the area. Uh, as the postmaster, I often asked him why so many people were bringing big packages uh, to the post office and where were they going? And I learned from him that they were going to Eastern Europe to places mm -hmm. under the Iron Curtain. And I think in a way it was a mini geography lesson and a <laughs> child's understanding that there were people in places in very difficult straits uh, that we needed to support. And those people who were bringing those big packages were doing just that, supporting people uh, who were in very difficult straits. And I think uh, also it was that sort of lesson without preaching, that, that seeing this kind of commitment play out and the affection uh, the community had for him uh, that really had an indelible um, marking on me clearly uh, because it's something I still think about uh, <laughs> and and uh, follow. He, um, he was also interested in politics. We had some relatives who ran for political office. Um, we were Democrats uh, and he and I, as I grew older, would often go at it. He would support candidates I didn't much care <laughs> for and I would support other candidates. And it was, uh, it was just, we weren't really sparring so much as I think it was that kind of relationship with a parent uh, mm -hmm. that you could engage in those kinds of conversations. Uh, so that's a little bit of my uh, my growing up and the kinds mm -hmm. of things that 
influenced me. Yes, it's uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? It feels it feels a little bit as you speak like it was a bit of a boiling pot, a boiling pot of um, that um, introduction to the political landscape. Um, a lot of young people miss out on that. I think they engage in so many other activities that that um, early awareness of politics and how it influences our lives and the good it can do gets missed, doesn't it? Yes, I, I think it does. And then I think about the kinds of, some of the kinds of activities I, like any child, obviously played sports and uh, did the the kinds of things we're all familiar with. But I, I also collected stamps. At one point, my cousin and I wanted to start a stamp company, mm -hmm. never realizing that we needed customers and we only had each other. <laughs> but as I look back, I learned a lot about the world from that experience. And then having pen pals. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth thinking about as parents or as people who are in a position to influence children, just how these kinds of imprints uh, can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that we leave those um, values and the beliefs and um, everything um, about our own knowledge, we leave those footprints and imprints uh, in our families, don't we? Um, when we first met, you described yourself a little bit as a nerdy teenager and a young woman, and I recall you were quite politically active in your high school. I'm wondering if you could share some of those um, anecdotes with me and also your path to university and into the roles in the political arena because it's uh, I find it a really interesting story. Well, I'm afraid I really was quite nerdy in that respect. Uh, but I had this passion and interest in politics um, that, of course, was nurtured in its embryonic stages by my father. Uh, and when I got to, to, to school, uh, to high school, I went to a boarding school. Uh, I was trying to explain to my classmates why I thought these were important issues. And I'm afraid most of them really didn't care as much as I did. I would race to the library and read the New York Times, trying to find out what was happening in the world. And I created this organization called Student America. And I would put up on this bulletin board, and I still can see it all these years later, where the bulletin board was fixated on the wall and how I would come with articles from Time Magazine, from Newsweek, from other sources, trying to say, this is what's happening in our world. This is what's happening in the country. And I was so excited about it. I was hoping that my classmates would be uh, excited as well. And one of the things they always pointed out was that ha having been a boarding student, I, you know, mail was a big thing, hearing from your family, hearing from your friends, but I got tons of mail and a lot of it had to do with these various issues. I had the subscriptions to the magazines and probably one of the most um, uncommon uh, was getting the congressional record every day. And every day <laughs> that the United States Congress is in session, they put out the proceedings and mm -hmm. I would get these proceedings why I was subscribing only <laughs> some force knows but I was intrigued by what was being said uh and who was saying it uh but I never lived down the uh the kind of reactions from my classmates who said why the heck are you getting all of this stuff uh, but I really did care about it and I hope that in the process some of that was left with them as well it's 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 a fascinating story isn't it as to what it is that um sparks and interest when we're so young. Your roles during the Clinton administration as assistant to the president and chief of staff to the first lady were during really critical times for defining pathways to gender equity globally. Can you please explore some of the initiatives and events you led or were involved in during this time and the influence you believe they've achieved, they have achieved? Well, you know, Lynn, it really was a seminal time for me uh, becoming engaged in the issues that Zonta International is so passionate about. Um, for one, uh, the First Lady 
was first lady during the time that we were preparing, the world was preparing uh, for the uh, UN Fourth World Conference on Women that took place in Beijing. And uh, there were many uh, preparations that were engaged with that in terms of the delegation that the United States would, would send. Um, we, we had selected um, Madeleine Albright, who was then the ambassador mm. to the United Nations before she became Secretary of State, uh, to be the head of the US delegation. And we, we really made a concerted effort uh, to make it as diverse and representative of the country as possible. So we had a Muslim physician. We had a male who was a former governor of a state. We had a woman who was active on um, editing a women's magazine. We had a nun who had run a university. It was to say, and this is something the first lady was keenly interested in, is this is not some esoteric gathering. This is about all of us. It's about women everywhere. Yes, we're going off to China, but it is about us in the United States as well. And in her <clears throat> keynote address, she did talk about whether you find yourself at home with your children or at the water cooler in the office. It was a sense of this is about all of us and all of us uh, should have an interest in this. And she had been invited by the then Secretary General uh, to give a special keynote address. As I said, the official uh, head of our delegation was Madeleine Albright. Hillary came in uh, to deliver the keynote address. And there was a lot of preparation that went into that speech, uh, but we were careful not to share it too widely with others in the government or outside the government uh, for fear that it would turn into something we didn't recognize after an editing process that was just uh, over the top. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and what happened uh, was that the, the uh, first lady, her husband, the president, and a few of us on the staff really worked it, uh, worked the message, uh, the women's rights message that I know Santa International is so committed to. And there was much speculation about what she would say. In fact, I remember the White House communications person being asked by the press corps, which was keenly interested in, was she going to go? And that was a big question because at the time there was a human rights activist, a Chinese American, Wu, who got himself back into China and everybody thought that was gonna be the end of this. She'd never get to go. So there were all these tensions and the press kept asking questions. And at one point, right before departure, they asked what she was going to say. And the White House communications director opined that she really wouldn't make any news and this would be you know, <laughs> a typical presentation of America's position. And I'm always struck by how people can say they know what somebody else is gonna say without ever having seen even a draft mm. of what she was going to say. Mm. Uh, but when she did arrive in China, we actually met up in Hawaii because she was there with the president at the time. Madeleine Albright came on board as did um, a couple of key officials uh, who oversaw US-China relations, et cetera. And there was also great fear, of course, that, you know, the far right was saying that she would destroy the American family by going. Uh, the, the people in the diplomatic corps, many of them were saying she'd upset China-American relations. Uh, others were saying uh, she shouldn't be spending taxpayer money going and doing this. <laughs> it was just so much. And we, we don't often think of what it often takes to get to these um, critical forums uh, for a purpose like this. But as, as we made our way across the world um, and, and the moment came when she got up to give the speech, I remember being with our speechwriter behind the curtain uh, as she got up to the podium 
And I was frankly a nervous wreck because so <laughs> much had, so much tension uh, existed prior to going because of all of these forces that knew what was best for her. And, and at first the audience didn't react any in any significant way. Of course, as you know so well, UN audiences don't always react in any emotive way. Uh, but as she got into the speech and start talking about the kinds of experiences that women endure in many places in the world, issues like honor killings or dowry burnings that only affect some parts of the world, but violence against women in the home or rape uh, during conflict or human trafficking, just a, a, a range of issues, not even being able to survive often if you were born a girl because your status was viewed as uh, one that wasn't worth uh, continuing by some. And as she would say each of these, she would add after each example, and this is a violation of human rights. And you could begin to see the audience was getting really into it because while there were many government representatives in the room, and it was a cavernous room, it was enormous, there were also activists, people who had worked on these issues globally. And there they had one of the most powerful women in the world come and say, this is a violation of human rights. When many in their experience would even give them any attention or would consider it some marginal activity in which they were engaged. And by the time she finished, it, it rose to a crescendo and that crescendo was women's rights are human rights. Mm -hmm. Human rights are women's rights. Yes, women are human and women's rights are human rights. Mm -hmm. As though that was something that seemed so out of the ordinary and yet it is something that should be nothing but ordinary mm -hmm. in terms of everybody getting it and understanding it and recognizing it. And the place just, you know, I still can hear people beating on the, the desks in front of them, um, just standing and being engaged. And as we were walking out, some delegations that weren't exactly cordial on these issues were saying that was bravo, that was extraordinary. You know, we can, uh, we can agree with that. Uh, reporters who traveled with us, some of the women said, I felt that I lost my media independence because I was in tears of uh, feeling so proud of what was said. And two of the newspapers of record, one being the New York Times, which I think everybody knows, and another being a, a more um, right of center periodical, both agreed it was her finest hour, going and really stressing the extraordinary import of these issues. And before then, many governments, even my own government, didn't work on some of these issues because they weren't viewed as violations of human rights. Uh, so it was finally proclaiming this in international law and really creating an agenda that had to go forward robustly on everything from girls' education uh, and the importance of that to fighting human rights abuses, mm -hmm. to empowering women through economic opportunity, et cetera. And for me and for her, uh, it really charted our course thereafter uh, in very significant mm -hmm. ways. It's, it was such a, um, a quintessential moment, wasn't it? And in where we've come today, and it's coming up to 30 years ago, if I, if my maths is correct this morning, that, um, of that speech and the work that the UN has championed and many, many governments around the world continue to work on. So a little bit later on in our conversation, I'll draw some thoughts from you on where we're at now in this whole 
uh, women's rights, a human rights movement, and we can share some ideas. So it's it, it, I've listened to the speech so many times or parts of the speech many, many times over those years and uh, I've always feel incredibly thankful that um, Mrs Clinton, First Lady, was able to be there and to make that speech, which, as you said, was probably her finest moment and defining well, moment of her time. Well, many of us have been engaged in processes to mm. um, try to understand how far we've come, what kind of progress have we made. And sadly, we have not made the kind of progress we should. Uh, and in fact, today in our world, there is a great deal of pushback on these issues. And it seems to have escalated. I was having a, a conversation with my daughter over the last couple of days about this very issue. And it seems to have regressed, if anything, at times, depending on who's talking about it and what the issue is and what all of the matters are that are before us in our individual countries, let alone on the global stage. And um, then you look at the World Economic Forum data and grown because of how it continues some countries doing better than others, but globally, so far, far behind. And then uh, Zondra International, of course, partners with arms of the UN to do various projects um, within its um, work through the Foundation for Women. But sometimes I, I, I feel as though we haven't made the progress we ought to have made, um, Alan. And I always thought, when I was in my age group now, when I was a lot younger, that would be much further down the pathway towards gen the equity that's required to get to equality. So it's, yeah, uh, we still don't see equal. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. And and you're mentioning the World Economic Forum. I think mm -hmm. is very instructive because uh, they put out this gender gap report, and that's mm -hmm. um, what is the gap like in a given country uh, for women in certain areas and men. And those four metrics, health, education, economic participation and political participation. Education and health is moving with greater progress with still a lot of way to go. The economic progress is still very much uh, uh, not where it needs to be. And the political situation for women is the hardest of all, that gap, uh, women exceeding political power and what many are enduring today and being pushed back. And as a result, the World Economic Forum says it's gonna take over a hundred years <laughs> at the rate we're going to actually be able to close that gap. And each year when I read that report, you know, you can hear the collective groan, can't you, from women who, um, I, maybe in the baby boomer generation, most of us expected we'd be further down the pathway. And then for our younger women coming uh, behind us, children and grandchildren, and the young girls who are in school, um, how is it that um, the work we continue to do? And I say this to all, particularly Zonta members who are with us today, what is it we can do? And sometimes all we can do is one person at a time, one thing at a time, one person at a time. And the collection of one person at a time can make a difference along with the sort of influence you've been able to have in the positions you've had globally. So it's the global work, but it's the local work too, isn't it? It's the one it person at a time. It absolutely is, Lynn. And I love what you just said, because I believe that's the hallmark of Zanta but it's also essential for progress. And I was a bit frustrated <clears throat> with a friend some years ago at how slow this was, was occurring, this progress. And we wrote a book called Fast mm. Forward. And the, the title was about, the gist of it is that we've got to get to a place that's much faster, much more accelerated than we are today like the World Economic Forum, we cannot afford another hundred years. Mm -hmm. And the whole, the whole um, message of the book was that each of us has power and we can take that power and we can combine it with purpose, use all of the benefits of today's uh, vastly accelerated world and work for women and girls progress that if we put our minds to it, and it, it tells the story of 
people in business, people who started organizations. It was really one person at a time, as you said. And this aggregate can can really aggregate of purpose uh, can make the biggest difference. It took me a long time to come around to that view um, when I wanted to have, when I personally wanted to have bigger inf influence. And then you go and you do that when you work corporately, you do it in all of the things you do. But when I no longer worked corporately and I worked for myself, I went, well, how can I continue to make that difference? And it occurred to me, it was one person at a time often on one issue and calling out poor behaviour, calling out opinions that don't uh, reflect um, the importance of the cause and the importance of women's rights, the human rights. And also, um, I have had a haven't read your entire book yet, but I have had a look at parts of it and I see that um, sense uh, being reflected in your research and your work. So uh, it, it's a really interesting piece that each one of us, men and women, can contribute and then it all gets added up or aggregated. And it so, is men too. Uh, yes. We do tell the stories of some of the men who, uh, you know, in the positions that they had really wanted to uh, ensure greater progress for women and girls. And those are uh, magnificent uh, examples. Uh, and it's women at all levels, at the lowest grassroots level to the highest levels of power. It, you don't have to be, you know, in the C-suite or in the office of the president. Mm -hmm. You really can make a difference. And one of the stories I, I just want to share is um, it was about a young woman who was working for a company. It was a women's apparel company that had a great record on fighting violence against women, domestic violence. And the co company was reorganizing and they were trying to make their profits accelerate. And in the process, this great project that they were collecting even awards for their commitment was going to go by the side. And a young woman who really was not a most powerful woman in this company decided she would go to the new CEO he had just been brought in. She was fearful as he began to uh, spin off various so-called costly or perceived costly uh, ventures that this might go. And she said she got up her strength and she went in and, and talked to him about what a difference it was making. And it was he, the CEO, who told me the story. He said, I didn't really know about this issue. I didn't know what the company was doing. And as a result of that young woman's intervention, he said, the last thing I was going to do was end that initiative. Mm. So it's that power of the voice. So that leads us into how, how do we as women claim a voice? But how do we get the men around us to also claim their voice? Because it, it's not just women's work, is it? Uh, I'll get off my soapbox because the conversation is with you today, Milan. But no, is, but I love it's, hearing it's you as well. Work. It's, it's men's work as well as women's work and that power of the voice. And I think so much of the work that um, you do, and I'm, I'll come to that in a moment in your current work, is about the voice and, and raising women's voices and giving women that education to have a voice. If we go all the way back to the four pillars in the World Economic Forum, one of them is education. But For education sure. goes with economic goes with economic potential or economic power. So it's... it's, um, it's endlessly fascinating to discuss and endlessly frustrating when we can't see it progressing. Can I move on with you to the work you did um, some that you founded some time ago in the Vital Voices Global Partnership, which was also about investing in women leaders. Can, can you give me, give me and the audience just a short version of the why? Well, well when that? we were, mm. when I was working <clears throat> with the first lady, um, as a result of the Beijing conference, she began to travel the world uh, and work with women, putting a spotlight on the difference they were making, trying to uh, trying to inspire leaders to see what a difference it made in their country, uh, really helping galvanize the spirit uh, to bring about uh, the kind of change that was necessary. Uh, and 
one of the things we did was uh, work on a project under then Secretary Madeleine Albright called the Vital Voices Democracy Initiative. It was an official program, but it really was about individuals like Zonta members, for example, who would lend their skill sets to work with women in different parts of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. And those could be communication skills, how to build a, a small business, how to hold your government accountable. And we would convene them in different regions of the world. And the first one took place in, in Vienna, in Austria, for women in Eastern Europe who had slowly been coming out of the Soviet Union uh, and what the democratization process would represent. Uh, and this went on for all of the years that we were working in government and um, many women came and joined us uh, as trainers, instructors. Um, one woman at the time said to me, I walked into this conference and I saw the menu of what we could take, what lectures we could go to, what training sessions we could go to. And she said it was like a banquet feast and I wanted to eat everything and I knew I couldn't eat everything. Mm -hmm. So it was very exciting for people, especially women going through a transition uh, who were longing mm -hmm. to have the kinds of um, good consequences happen in their lives like Zonta still works on, for example. And when the administration was coming to a close, there was no guarantee that this program would continue. And the women who are now getting to know each other across borders, uh, really having coming together as a network, uh, came and said, you cannot orphan us now. You, you brought us together. We are learning things we never knew. For example, this woman from X country is doing a project I have longed to do and I never knew how I could do it. And now I'm watching what she's doing and I'm learning from her. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what really happened, uh, Lynn is like happens in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, Mrs. Clinton said, well, I think we've got to find a way to continue this work. Um, and that wound up with me and a few other individuals uh, trying to create a non-governmental organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you, it was rough. <laughs> Those first years of mm -hmm. building an organization, raising mm -hmm. the money, creating a board, putting together an agenda, um, it was very difficult. Uh, but today it's a vibrant global organization mm -hmm. working with women, emerging leaders mm -hmm. all around the world. Um, but that was its mm -hmm. start. It came out of mm -hmm. something we were doing uh, but it was going to end. Every likelihood was that it was going to end. Uh, and what were we going to do? And with so many um, great <coughs> projects, if you like, or great um, policy or whatever other word we could attribute to it, um, often ends at the end of administrations. And it happens throughout the world. Um, you know, it happens, it can even happen in NGOs such as Zonta, you know, great projects uh, come to an end in one um leaders yeah. time and then finding ways to continue that forward is always a challenge some years later during the obama administration president obama appointed you to the position of u.s ambassador for global women's issues and i know it was the first time for such a position and i know you had a significant leadership role in the development of the national action plan on women peace and security and travel even more extensively than you had what do you think were the significant achievement during that administration and your time? Well, first of all, it was a great privilege. It was a, a privilege to represent my country on these issues. Um, and it, it was really interesting. I think I mentioned it to you when we first met uh, that it was Australia that created, was the government that created the second uh, ambassador for women. I think it was ambassador for gender equality, mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was the time, it was the time to begin uh, this kind of process within government very seriously. And when I got the nod from the president and then was confirmed by our Senate, I was told that my job was not to create lovely programs that could benefit women 
globally. That was all to the good. But my job was to integrate gender, integrate the gender perspective, integrate women's engagement into all of the policies and programs that our State Department, our Ministry uh, for Foreign Affairs was undertaking. And that meant working with very senior diplomats, the majority of whom were men, and, and telling them, working with them, not by saying, you need to do this, even though the secretary was a major um, supporter, but why it would make us collectively more effective, why they would be collectively more effective. And there were a range of issues that we focused on. One was women's economic empowerment, uh, looking at various programs that the U.S. government had in the in the uh, through our diplomatic work uh, that really very few had a gender component to them, and I, I remember vividly our ambassador for APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Platform. Australia is a very active member in APEC, uh, as are those twenty six economies that hug the Pacific Ocean. And he came to me and he said, are you sending any women in your office to the APEC conference, which was taking place in Japan that year? And I said, why should I? I see nothing in this agenda about women's economic empowerment, about entrepreneurship and women, et cetera. And I said, is there anything I can do? Is there anything we can do, our government can do to change this? And he said, well, you can go to Japan and you can make this argument to my counterparts, all of the equivalent ambassadors to APEC for their countries and see what happens. So I went and I remember vividly that when I finished, the first gentleman came up to me and it was all men in the room. And he said, you talked about economics. And I thought to myself, what did he think I was gonna talk about? <laughs> probably the feminist manifesto or something, but I had lots of data, including data from the region about how if women were integrated into the economy and fully participating, what it would do for growing economies, for inclusive prosperity, et cetera. And slowly we began to make progress, uh, starting in Japan that year, and then the following year, it was in the United States. And of course, we went all out to get these issues on the agenda. And the, the, the level of presidents of the countries and highest corporate people uh, voted to um, create women in the economy as part of APEC. Mm -hmm. and, and we really focused on women's entrepreneurship for that catalytic force creating small and medium-sized businesses and what that would do and but women confront all kinds of obstacles mm -hmm. obstacles to raising capital obstacles to markets where were they going to sell their products or services training obstacles technology gaps etc um long story short apec just concluded last week i think uh, mm -hmm. And this is a very vibrant part uh, of APEC yes. today. But that was about, you know, really working within the government mm -hmm. to try to bring about change. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing you mentioned, the Women, Peace and Security mm -hmm. uh, framework that the United Nations developed. It's now 20 plus years ago, mm -hmm. recognizing that women experience conflict differently and that they have an incredibly important role to play in peace and security. Mm -hmm. And identifying those pillars of the framework, women's work in prevention, women's work in negotiations and mediation, uh, in bringing disparate warring parties together, uh, in, in recovery and reconstruction, big issue now mm -hmm. confronting Ukraine will be a very big mm -hmm. issue. And then mm -hmm. recognizing all of those pillars were about women's agency. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth pillar was about protecting women because in these conflicts, the experience of sexual violence mm -hmm. is a tool of war used really absolutely. As, weapon, as a weapon. Um, it and, is weaponized and I don't think it's always understood that. 
you know, that it is used as a weapon. Yeah. And and so as a government, uh, the Secretary Clinton at the time uh, went to the United Nations and, and she announced she worked on a resolution, one of the resolutions to 1325 on the sexual violence. But she also made it known that the United States would create a national action plan. We didn't have one at that point. We were late. Uh, and today we have the only law because as a result of that effort, there was a movement in Congress to basically codify, create a law on the United States engagement uh, on the role of women in peace and security. Uh, so those were some of the kinds of things that I grappled with uh, mm -hmm. those four years when I was in government. And then you think of how it's still being grappled with throughout the throughout the world, isn't it? One of the other powerful places, um, and I, get, I guess I've got two for us to do before we finish today. One is um, the Commission on the Status for Women, uh, where Zonta International has the consult general consultative status. And I note that alongside of your roles during the Obama administration, you were the US representative on that commission as well. What do you think, um, or how is it? I, I'm sorry, let me get the question right. How is it that the Commission on the Status for Women is moving to make a difference? Because it's been in place some time and uh, I know it um, perhaps evaluates and monitors um, the outcomes from the Beijing conference all those years ago. But for the people listening to us today and watching us, what do you think it is that this commission in particular has the power to do and is influencing over time? Well, it is, it is a very, it has a very special mission mm -hmm. at the United Nations, uh, as you pointed out, and it, it does hold um, the world in, in many ways uh, accountable on, on a range of um, frameworks that have been developed to support women's progress. Um, and beyond that, what is stunning about CSW when it occurs every year is the large numbers <clears throat> of women, especially from around the world who gather. I'm always blown away because that commitment is there. It's stronger than ever. I think there are many who feel that there have to be creative efforts made uh, to make the, the CSW mission more tangible. Uh, and because there's a, a draft resolution that is put together at the culmination of every CSW to move the agenda forward. And a couple of years ago, it was very clear, we could not take progress for granted because there was an effort to really begin to undo some of the progress that's been made. So I think we're gonna find out more and more dealing with pushback is going to be um, something we've got to be uh, much more uh, creative and, and, and looking for ways to, to really push back the pushback, if I can say that. Um, and and this, this platform is a powerful platform uh, in which to do that. There also is, you know, UN Women is a part of um, the UN structure as well. And I think there is growing concern, uh, some concern uh, that we need to ensure within the United Nations that there is a stronger understanding uh, of the role of women's participation, women's leadership uh, in that institution for the good of the world. Many of the things we all work on were created by the United Nations, but yet many of these things, women, peace and security, for example, that framework is nowhere near being fulfilled. Its promise is, is, is really years behind where it should be at this point. So that when an Afghanistan happens, when a Ukraine happens, when a Myanmar happens, when all of these conflicts develop, leaders should be factoring in the women, peace and security framework and that is not happening for the happening. most part. So we have a lot of work to do and I think CSW is an important platform. And you're still having a platform to influence that future, aren't you, in your current role as executive director in the Georgetown Institute with Women, Peace and Security. <laughs> and of course, I, I read the goals of that and we talked about it and I 
It's all about setting that more stable, peaceful and just world. How does your current role allow you to have that influence? Well, you know, being in academia, it's like rounding out my career on women's rights because I've been in government. I started and ran an NGO for a long time. And now I'm in academia, which I think the work, the kind of research that gets done, creating that data-based case, that evidence-based case, uh, was one of the inspirations for me to go to Georgetown University, uh, where I am, uh, so that we could, uh, when, when attention is not being paid to these issues, demonstrate what a difference it would make if these issues were considered. And I think that evidence-based case is critically important. But we also have the opportunity to convene uh, and bring people not always like-minded together to address issues that don't always get a hearing. We talked about CSW. We do an awful lot of side events, additional events, virtual events uh, to, to really work and, and bring prominence to these issues. And also education of the next generation. Uh, one of the things we've instituted at Georgetown is what we call a certificate in gender peace and security, which means that it will demonstrate a concentration to a future employer that you have know-how in terms of gender-based budgeting, mainstreaming, working these issues in peace and security. Uh, and there are more and more of these opportunities opening up and we need smart people to be able to come in and engage on them. So I have the opportunity now to uh, to do some of those those kinds of uh, things. I, uh, I uh, you know, have more time to think about uh, than I had when I was in uh, government, perhaps, or or the frenzy of running an NGO. But it's it's ironic in a way, Lynn, because you asked me about my past, and I decided as a high school student that I wanted to go to Washington uh, for my college education. And so I only applied to Georgetown. I didn't know a whole lot about it. Uh, and I wound up there and it was the experience of being in the capital of the United States with all of the, uh, the, the kind of activity that was going on in, in our country at that time in the 60s. And I wind up now, it's probably my last chapter, back at the university, only in a different capacity. So it's coming you can full never circle. predict. You can never predict. <laughs> I don't think we can, can we? And it's about uh, accumulating experience and knowledge and, um, and, and confidence that we will end up in the best places. Can I ask you one, um, and I, uh, only a couple of questions, and we must close this amazing conversation. What do you think is your greatest leadership power or gift? If you had to name one or maybe two, what do you think it is that you think is takes you to where you've come in all your years in this work? I think it's what I learned from my father. Commitment, uh, purpose in life. Um, that in, and combined with a passion to do these things. Now, people ask me, how do you keep doing that? I often say, you know, I just changed my chair. I moved from one place to another, but I'm still working on these issues. But the reality is it's the women around the globe who are doing such astounding work on the front lines, often at great risk to themselves, teaching all of us. And I feel the least we can do is be supportive to bring that kind of change we wanna mm -hmm. see in the world. And it's through their agency that that change will come. So mm -hmm. commitment, a sense of purpose, a deep passion uh, for these issues. What was it you used when things got really tough or you faced a challenge that at the time seemed almost too much to face? What did you rely on? Well, I... I relied on people around me clearly and other people who cared. I know I'm not in this work by myself, but I also did think of what I just said about those women around the globe. Um, you know, I think of what's happening in Afghanistan today where gender apartheid is really what the Taliban are pursuing 
where a woman is losing all her rights to a job, to go to school, uh, to, to dress in a way that she isn't brought down, you name it, they're stripping her of all of her rights. How can one stop um, even when we are beset with issues of one kind or another, and even in our work, when those kinds of things are occurring? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is an inspiration, but no person is an island. And I feel there are always communities of interest uh, that keep us all going. I had one of my previous guests, Milan, tell me that she's got a girl gang and um, she reaches out to that girl gang. Uh, clearly that young woman was in, a bit younger than you and me, but um, reaches out to her girl gang and she has this girl gang around her. And I thought, I love it. what a lovely phrase, what a lovely phrase. I have this girl gang that yep. I go to and it includes my mum and it includes my sister, but it includes this friend and that friend and this person at work. And it was a really lovely story as well. So I think you've just described your girl gang as well that you well, work and with think, and that you go to. Yes. And we all need community. We need communities around us. Uh, and that's why I was so happy when you reached out because I think the Zonta community around the globe makes such a difference. And each of the members should recognize uh, that every small step uh, is a step to a bigger step. So your final thought for us today? is to keep going, not give up. As Gandhi said, we have to be the change we want to see in the world. And I think it comes down to that still. Um, Ambassador Milan Bavia, you are indeed an inspiration to me, to everyone that you meet and the work and the opportunities you've had and how you've made those opportunities work is in, incredibly remarkable. And I thank you for being a friend of Zonta. Uh, with friends like you, Zonta's in a very, very good place. So thank you so much for your generosity with me today and in getting to know you. And I do wish you well for whatever comes next because I can't believe it's your last chapter. I suspect Well, one never you're... knows, right? But, but thank you, Lynn. It was a pleasure to be able to speak with you. I enjoyed it. Thank you.